Loving God and Father, we give you thanks this morning for this opportunity to open the Scriptures. As we open the Scriptures, we pray that you would open our hearts. John Calvin said that the greater part of wisdom is to know two things, knowledge of self and knowledge of you. Give us that knowledge this morning, Lord, as we open your word, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So Brian slid into the confessional, and in his arms was a big turkey. And he said to the priest, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. And would you please take this turkey off my hands and discharge my guilt? I stole it to feed my family, and now I feel badly about it. And the priest said, certainly not. And your penance is that you have to return that turkey from the person that you stole it from. And Brian sobbed, but Father, I tried, and he wouldn't take it. And the priest said, well, if that's true, then, then take the turkey and feed your family with it. The priest carried on in his duties, another couple hours of confessions, and then he retreated to the rectory, and as he walked into the kitchen, he realized somebody stole his turkey. <laughs> you know, Protestants are reactive. Um, Protestant doesn't mean protest. We think that's what Protestant means, so we protest what the Catholic Church does. The Catholics have confession, therefore we don't have or we don't do confession. And we throw the baby out with the back bathwater. Actually, Protestant comes from compound word protestari, for a positive testimony, for a testimony. Um, and the testimony of the Protestants was that we have forgotten the good news. Yes, confession is important, and no, we shouldn't throw confession away. But the good news is that we are forgiven in Jesus Christ. And so that is part of the lesson I want us to take from our time in the scriptures this morning. In September of 1972, beautiful sunny day, uh, on a busy intersection on the loop in Chicago. If you're from Chicago, you'll know what the loop is. Busy intersection, middle of the day, people are hurrying by to go to lunch or they're on their way to conduct business. There was a man there, stern-faced, plain-dressed, standing looking down at the sidewalk, and then periodically he would look up, and whoever was nearest to him, he would point at them and say, guilty! And then he would lower his arm, and he'd wait a moment or two, and then he'd raise his arm again, and whoever was near him, guilty! And in this pantomime, people weren't sure how to react to that as they were bustling by on the way, and they looked at him, pointing at them, and then they looked at the crowd. What must the crowd be thinking of me? Guilty of what? What did I do? And then, then they looked down at the ground and they hustled away so that they could get free of that. Carl Menninger in 1973 wrote a book called Whatever Became of Sin. And that's how his book starts with that, that story of what took place on the loop. We're in the season of Lent. Lent is a time of preparation for Easter. It's a recognition of why Jesus came. It says in Luke's gospel that Jesus set his face resolutely to go to Jerusalem in order that he might die on the cross, die for our sins. And so Lent is a reminder to us of what this free gift that God offers us cost him, cost him his son. This free gift isn't free. It's not valueless. It's of inestimable value. Now, I'd like you to turn to your left and look at that person. I'd like you to turn to your right and look at that person. I'd like you to point up here at me with your finger and say, guilty. guilty. Thanks. Appreciate that. <laughs> Everybody you looked at is a sinner. And if you're indignant because I called you a sinner, or if you're angry because I called you a sinner, then you are in the wrong place. The church is a hospital for sinners. It is not a museum for plaster saints. So we are all, and get it out on the table, sinners. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. So stop pretending as if you're not. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a wonderful little, classic little book, Life Together. It's about his experience running an underground seminary in Nazi Germany. And in that book, he says, when sin has a man alone, he is utterly alone. Because the pious fellowship will permit no one to be a sinner. Therefore, we have to lie to ourselves and to God. We have to cover up 
and pretend to be something that we are not. And unthinking Christians are absolutely appalled and shocked when a real sinner is discovered in the presence of the redeemed. Why? If we're a hospital for sinners, then we ought to recognize that that's the reality in which we live. That that person who's fallen is as fallen as I am. You know, the world says if you're fallen that you're fraudulent. Oh, the world, the press, loves to trumpet when a Christian stumbles and falls and does something stupid. And, and we do. Hello? I do. We do. And yet they say, oh, it's a sign that they're a hypocrite and it's a sign that the faith isn't real and it's a sign that it's all a lie and a bunch of nonsense. And no, it's a sign that that person is human and that they're broken and that they are a sinner. And that doesn't mean that we, we shoot our wounded and we put them out and out of our minis, minis, uh, misery. I want you to imagine with me for just a moment, have Jim turn the screens back on. And when the screen comes on, up on that screen is every iniquity, every transgression, every sin, every bad thing, evil, every vile word, every bad thought that you've ever had in your life. And there it is in living color for all of us to watch. Any volunteers to go first? Jackson Nelson volunteered at the last service. I don't have any volunteers here today. Sin causes us to duck and cover. We put on a mask. We pretend to be something that we aren't. And it's a lie. Turn with me, if you would, to the Psalms, Psalm 32. This is our text for today. The responsive reading is also based on the same, the same text, the same thing. We know this story. David wasn't where he was supposed to be. He was supposed to be with his armies out on the battlefield. No, he was at the parapet of his palace, looking down, watching a young woman bathing. And he lusted for her, and he was the king, and called her to the palace, and he lay with her, and she got pregnant. He was so concerned about getting found out, getting caught, that he had her cuckolded husband murdered. This is, a, this is a confession of sin about adultery and murder. And it's incredibly upbeat. This, this is really, it's surprising. We just sang a song about the, the, the joy of our salvation. The call to worship this morning was rejoice and sing the joy of our salvation. I have some friends here in the church that are dog walkers. And it's not their dog that they're walking, but they're walking a dog. And they have to take a plastic bag with them because they can't leave the dog's deposit on somebody else's uh, lawn. That's the picture that we have here. We have two bookends. I want you to notice how the psalm starts and how the psalm ends. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Down to the middle of verse 10. Steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice and shout for joy all the upright in heart. It's a hermetically sealed bag. You reach down and all the gross stuff is between the beginning and the end and it's all tied up in a knot and sealed. It's not that it doesn't exist, but it's been taken care of. And David finally understands the good news. You see, his cabinet had done their investigation. And the lead uh, chief prosecutor came to him, Nathan the prophet, and said, guilty. You are the man. You can read about it in 2 Samuel chapter 11. You are the man. Now, Nathan did this at the risk of the relationship that he had with David. They were friends. David, or Nathan did this at the risk of his own life. David's already demonstrated a willingness to kill in order to cover up his crime. So Nathan didn't know what was going to happen when he came to confront David with his sin. We all need a Nathan, or more than one Nathan, in our lives. Do you have a Nathan? Have you given permission to anyone in your life to confront you about your sin, to tell you when you're going wrong? About 20 years ago, when Cheryl and I were living in California, our marriage imploded. And most of that was my sin, the lion's share of it. Not all of it, but the lion's share of it was, was my sin. I had three friends, Chuck, and Steve and John, they got on an airplane on, in Baltimore and they flew to LA. They flew out to confront me, to 
speak truth to me, to tell me the truth about myself and about my behavior and about what I was doing. They loved me enough to put our relationship on the line. They didn't have to do that, but they were willing to do that because they loved me. They came to me and said, we were at your wedding and you promised to love and to cherish her and you're not treating her the way you're supposed to treat her. Uh, now, was I pleased to hear that? Not so much. But you don't know why. It doesn't matter. I made a promise. Have you given permission to somebody in your life to be a Nathan, to tell you the truth and to speak the truth? George MacDonald, I love him. He's a wonderful author. C.S. Lewis said of George MacDonald that he baptized my imagination. George MacDonald says this, you can trust the Lord with your past as well as you can trust him for your future as long as you're not trying to hide anything. When you stop hiding and you tell the truth about yourself and about the circumstances in which you are living, when you tell the truth, you are plunged into the bath of truth, and it's all washed away. So the first point today is that there is no skeleton in your closet that will chase God away. It's not as if God doesn't know who you are, what you've done. It's all an open book to him anyway. You remember being a child, and you did something that you knew was wrong, and you tried to hide it from your parents. You might have lied. You might have stolen something. And the guilt began to weigh on you and began to press down upon you and began to crush you. And eventually you went to your parents and you confessed this thing that you did and they knew about it anyway. But do you remember the feeling of, oh, the monkey is off my back. Oh, the freedom. I don't have to continue to lie about this. I don't have to keep my story straight. I don't have to expend energy on maintaining a facade that isn't real. That's what David experienced when he was confronted by Nathan the prophet. Again, Psalm 32, the beginning of the, of the uh, psalm. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Menninger, in his book, Whatever Became of Sin, he says, sin has a weight that presses down on us. When we're expending all of our energy trying to maintain the mask, maintain the facade, to pretend that we have it all together, then it saps our strength. It shortens our attention span, and it reduces our patience for dealing with other people and their mess because we're spending all of our energy dealing with us and our mess. David says, no, when I confessed my sins, that weight fell off. I'm free from that. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, it's for freedom that Christ sets you free. For freedom, do not be subject again to a yoke of bondage. And we do it to ourselves. We do something that we're ashamed of. We do something that we know is wrong, and we put this yoke on ourselves. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. You don't have to walk around under that burden, under that weight. You don't have to pretend. You don't have to do all of that stuff to maintain being a good person. Hey, newsflash, there are no good persons here. The person to your left is not good. The person to your right is not good. Point at me and say guilty. Oh, with heart and meaning. Yeah. Myself included. That's, that's, that's the reality of it. And yet there is no skeleton in your closet that will drive God away from you. Professor of theology at my seminary, Fuller Theological Seminary, some years ago, his name was Bob Munger, wrote a classic little pamphlet. It's called My Heart, Christ's Home. When you give your life to Christ, when you receive God's gift of grace, he enters into you. So it says in 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? And so this little pamphlet is taking a tour of the rooms of your heart with Jesus, who you've now invited into your life, to whom you've given the deed to your life. He owns now your heart, your home. So you go into the den 
and what's on the TV. You think Jesus really wants to watch that? Is that something Jesus wants to look at? And then you go into the kitchen and, and you see all the chips and all the dips and all. The, and you think Jesus really wants to eat that stuff? And you really think that that's good for Jesus to have that stuff in the refrigerator and uh, in the pantry? And, and so they do this tour of the house and they go up the stairs. And the last room is the closet that's locked at the top of the stairs. Something died in there. Something stinks. There's a smell emanating from that closet. And Jesus goes to reach for the handle, and the guy says, No, no, Lord, don't go there. But you've given him the deed to your house. The whole house is his, but he won't go there unless you authorize it. He won't go there unless you give him the key. Open the door. That's what David says brings us freedom. It's when we let Christ go in, put on his hazmat suit from all the junk that's in there, and he enters into that closet, and he takes all that rotten stuff out, and he pitches it in the dumpster, and then he scrubs it all down and washes it with bleach, and now it's clean. Isaiah said, come and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. Jesus will clean out that closet if you will allow him to do so. There's no skeleton in your closet that will drive Jesus away. But you've got to open the door. David says the same thing. Look at verses 3 through 5. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as the heat of summer. But I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Give him the key. Open the door. Stop pretending. You don't have to. The power of sin is our fear of being found out. The power of sin is the shame and the grief and the guilt that we have from the stuff that we did. I told you about my marriage struggles. Not because I'm proud of them. No, I'm ashamed and I have regrets. But they don't have any power over me. It's done and over with. Christ has washed that away. And he will wash away whatever your thing is. And all of us have a thing. Maybe you didn't know that. We each have a catalog of sins. Each one of us. Better than that, each one of us has a specialty. There's a special sin that's special to you. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. Strip off all of the sins that entangle your feet. These besetting sins. This specialty that you are really good at. If you're going to sin, that's the one you keep going back to and doing over and over and over again. Strip it away. Confess it. Give it up. The power of sin is in the fear of it being found out. Well, let it go. It's done. It's over. It's in the past. I said, confess my transgressions to the Lord. I did not cover up my iniquity. I stopped pretending. I took off the yoke. I will confess my transgressions, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news. He came to set us free from sin. You know, the mainline churches, and many of you are refugees from the mainline, the mainline stopped teaching and preaching about sin. And it's a problem because Jesus came to redeem us. Jesus came to save us from our sin. But if we insist that we aren't sinners, if we insist that we aren't transgressors and lawbreakers, then why did Jesus come? And we cheapen salvation. And salvation ceases to mean much because if I'm not a sinner, I don't need to be saved from my sin. I don't need salvation. It ceases to be real when we pretend that we don't need Jesus. I need Jesus. And whether you know it or not, you need Jesus. It's why he came. We can't just toss it aside and, for, and pretend that, well, um, everything's fine. Donut hour. How are you? Good. How are you? Fine. Put the mask on. Pretend. How about if we do this for one another? Ask each other, how goes your walk with the Lord? How goes your walk with the Lord? The, the greatest preacher of the first great awakening in America was uh, George Whitfield. 
and he had more notches on his belt, more conversions than anybody in America. He was a great preacher. They said that he could speak to a crowd of 10,000, and when he whispered, the furthest out people could hear him as he whispered. Tremendous preacher, greatest preacher of the First Great Awakening. And when it came to the end of his life, he said, my ministry is a rope of sand. It amounted to nothing. I had lots of converts, but I didn't have any disciples. You know, Jesus didn't say, go and make converts of all the world. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all the world. Second best preacher of the First Great Awakening was Jonathan, I'm sorry, was John Wesley. And Whitfield pointed to Wesley and said he got it right because he made disciples. They were called Methodists because there was a method to their madness. They met in small groups and they were Nathan to one another. They gave each other permission to speak truth to one another. And they asked each other impertinent questions. How is your marriage? How is this sin or that sin in your life? How are you doing? And then at the end of this long list of questions, they would ask, and now, have you lied to me about any of your answers today? Because that's the reality. We cover up and we lie and we hide. And yet, they had a profound impact because there was a method. There was accountability. Yes, we can confess our sins to God, but to whom are you accountable? And there's a psychological value in confession, saying out loud, this is what I have done, and I'm sorry for it, and then hearing someone else, and it doesn't have to be a pastor or a priest, say to you that in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. That's why he came. In the name of Jesus, whatever that thing is, well, pastor, you don't know what I've done. I don't. Probably not murder, hopefully not adultery. I don't know what you've done, but he already knows. Open the door. Let that mess out. Therefore, let everyone who is godly, verse 6, offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Today is the day of salvation, according to Paul. No time like the present. Today is the day to clear the decks, to open the closet door at the top of the stairs. And if we will, he becomes a hiding place for us. He preserves us from trouble. He, sounds, he surrounds us with the shouts of deliverance. You know, God loves us so much that he's not content to leave us in our mess. How awesome is that? Look at verse 8. This is God speaking. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. The whole point of the faith is that we enter into a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. And when we mess up, he does not turn his back on us and say, oh, you're gross and go away and I'll never love you again. He doesn't cast us out of his house. No, he comes alongside of us. What does it say? I will instruct you and teach you. All scripture, says Paul, is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof. We need teaching, we need reproof, we need correction for training in righteousness. Because we don't, we don't arrive at that on our own. Our flesh wars against the spirit. Paul says in Romans 7, the thing that I don't want to do, I find myself doing. Oh, who will save me from this bondage that I'm in? Romans 7. Jesus does. And he will come alongside us and he will instruct us and he will show us a better way and he will keep his eye on us. Don't be like a horse or a mule without understanding. Get dragged along by the bit. If you have a dog and you take it for a walk and you have a 35-foot leash, where's your dog 35 feet away at the end of the leash? That's not what we desire for our relationship with God. We want to be unfettered. We want that yoke off our backs, but we want to walk closely in relationship with God. That's what David is talking about here. He says, many are the sorrows of the wicked. Indeed, they are. We live with guilt. We live with shame. We live with all of that mess that let it go. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous. Shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. How did David get to this shouting of joy and rejoicing out loud and singing songs of praise? He confessed his sin. In your bulletin, there's a place to take notes. It says, head, heart, hands. 
The great commandment, Jesus said, is that you're to love your God, love the Lord your God with your heart, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. Head, heart, hands. You've got a catalog of sins in your thought life, in your mind, in your intellectual life. What are your sins? Write them down where it says head. Don't show them to your partner. Don't show them to your next door neighbor. Don't look over the backs of the pews to see what people are writing down. This is between them and God and where it says heart, your affections, your emotions, the sins, your anger, the th sins of your, your heart, of your emotions, and then the sins of your hands, the things that you do that you know are not pleasing to God, but you do them anyway. Write those things down. Now, we don't have a bonfire going in the front yard, and if I was to bring our um, shredder in here, we'd burn it up. So I want you to just take a few moments and write down, head, heart, hands, your sins, the catalog. There's a catalog. You know what they are. Your besetting sin, whatever that is, and write it down. And when you get it home, burn it or run it through your shredder. David, in another psalm, Psalm 103, verse 12, says, As far as the east is from the west, so I have removed your transgressions from you. If you talk to an astronomer, as far as the east is from the west is infinity. It's gone. He's taken whatever it is you've written down. He's taken whatever it is that causes you guilt and shame, and he takes it away, and he removes it to infinity. You don't have to live under it. You don't have to carry it around. You can let it go, and you can forget about it. We continue to rehearse all of the hurts. We live in a culture that values being a victim. It's sick. It's pathological. So we catalog all of the hurts and all of the things that have been done to us and why I'm a victim. Let that go too. Let's own the stuff that we've done to ourselves, the stuff that we've done to our loved ones and our neighbors, and the stuff that we've done to God. Let's just be real about it. And you'll find that when you let it go, that you experience the freedom that David felt. Steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. God didn't forsake him, even in the face of adultery, even in the face of murder. God didn't desert him. Be glad in the Lord. You think David was glad? Where is our joy as Christians in our salvation? Christians are some of the glummest, gloomiest people you'd ever look at. Bummer. Bag of downers, dude. What is that? Where is the joy of our salvation? What person wants to be with a Debbie Downer all day long? Where's, what does David say? Be glad in the Lord. You think David was glad? The monkey's off his back. He's free. He doesn't have to pretend. Everybody knows. Yeah, he messed up big, in a big way. Most of us won't mess up as big as David did. And if we do, we can be glad and rejoice and shout for joy. Where is our joy? 